Welcome back to this week's OIS podcast. This week, we're bringing in three pairs of guests from the OIS Israel Innovation Showcase. Let's join host Susanna Nahum Zilberberg, Vice Chair of BioLight Life Sciences and co-founder of healthcare advisory firm IL.Factor as she speaks with startup founders, industry leaders, and investors. First up, we'll hear from AI Health co-founder and CEO Zach DeVay Aaron, PhD, and No Television CEO Kester Nahan as they discuss the possibilities in clinic-based eye care and share their advice for earlier stage companies. It seems that both of your companies are aiming to improve diagnosis and do it in a disruptive way to the traditional clinic-based uh, treatment protocol. Can you uh, please share your views about the limitation of the uh, clinic-based eye care as we know it today and how can your technologies improve it? Uh, Kester, would you start? Yeah, ha- happy to. I mean, what we're doing in office-based eye care really is we're, we're taking snapshots of chronic diseases yeah, that sometimes have an acute conversion to a disease that needs treatment. And in, in a way, we're not capturing the full patient journey. And by involving the home monitoring, by either structural or functional imaging, we're sort of taking diagnostics, in essence, for example, OCT from snapshots to a movie, which gives us continuous information and really enhances the way physicians can can make medical decisions. Doug? So in our space, because we screen for retinal images, it's quite amazing to see that currently the the high-risk population is not getting screened. So uh, currently, many of those people are just getting blind and the current solutions don't work very well. Uh, It's very hard to get visits to the ophthalmologists in some areas in the U.S., like in L.A., it would take you months to schedule a visit and even then you need to spare a day of work. And the current solutions to try and sending images to reading center, you know, they suffer from so many problems. Typically, you need to buy expensive cameras, you need to pay a lot of money for each read of those images and even then there is a huge administrative hassle by either you know chasing for an answer going back to the patient in many cases the images come back with insufficient quality so you need to call back the patient again and so we think ai really brings great advantages to to this space it's truly disruptive it solves both problems by being able to do it in a much more affordable way because the AI can can provide the reading. And then also by being able to answer the patient on the spot, you're saving so much administrative hassle as well. So uh, we're definitely seeing a lot of value and disruption in this kind of technology. Thank you, Zach. Uh, Kester, uh, it seems like when you deal with disruptive technology, uh, there is a lot about market education. Mm-hmm. Is that an obstacle? How do you deal with that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Especially when you provide the technology in a new care model. Yeah, um, We're not a software or a box company. We're actually a healthcare provider. Um, and as such, we are partnering with uh, office-based ophthalmologists and optometrists who refer their patients to us. And this is sort of a new relationship. Yeah, uh, We don't have an office in town Yeah, where you refer your patient. We're virtual. Um, and to build those relationships, it requires a lot of trust that we have to sort of develop, you know, not just in the technology, but in the relationship with us as a, as a provider. And of course, that's also reflected in the account management model when we introduce us to other providers so that they can, you know, they're, they're open to, to handle their patient for us in co-management. Absolutely. Zach, you're not being referred to by doctors, but you're approaching a new segment of doctors that will check uh, these patients. How do you deal with that? So this technology is really built for those clinics that are are outside of ophthalmology to do the screening. So that's really built for primary care physicians, for endocrinologists, for uh, uh, retail pharmacies. And that's really a breakthrough area where FDA really allows the AI to do the, the autonomous reading and we see a new CPT code by CMS to actually uh, get reimbursed for this AI-based reading. And we see great 
response from that target market. We also see now that the ADA, American Diabetes Association, has now included AI as part of the standard of care. So these are really exciting times. And yeah, we see great uh, feedback about that. Uh, Kester, since you have a lot of mileage uh, and uh, there are a lot of early stage companies uh, that are participating in this conference, what would be an advice that you will give for an earlier stage company that is entering this space? Yeah, yeah. I think Zach uh, hit the nail on the hat there. Reimbursement is absolutely key for everything we do. So engaging early with physicians, with societies, all stakeholders, to make sure that when you introduce a new technology, it not only addresses a clinical need, but it also fits into sort of the business case uh, of how um, physicians practice. And, and the physicians are key stakeholders here. And when you introduce technology, there still has to be a role for the physician. So I always like to think about sort of a physician-led process, you know, that is supported by AI, but it's not intended to replace the physician. And I think when you, when you address that early in the process, you get a lot of buy-in from the community and that ultimately supports your company. And Zach, since you're almost in the market, but you're very uh, into the development and clinical trials at the moment, if you would meet a new entrepreneur trying to get with a great innovation to the marketplace, what would be your advice? Well, I will say two things. First of all, uh, my advice would be to build the solution in Israel because that's where we have the best AI experts and data scientists. So that's definitely the place for innovation. The second advice would be uh, to really use the fantastic ecosystem that grew up here in, in this space of ophthalmology. We now have also funds, VCs like, uh, like BioLite, very much focused solely on you know, this area. So there is a lot of great connections and advice to, to get from this kind of, uh, of community. So it's a fantastic community and ent entrepreneurs should definitely take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for your participation in the conference and, and congratulations again for your progress. I think a lot of what you said today surfaced the value of CEOs in our community, uh, talking to each other and learning from each other. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you so much. Next up, we'll hear the esteemed Dr. Annette Lowenstein and Bionic Surgical co-founder Ron Schneider discuss what it takes to turn defense technologies into medical innovations. Back to you, Susanna. For the following discussion, I'm very happy to have Professor Annette Levinstein, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Sydney Fox, uh, Chair of Ophthalmology at the Sackler Faculty of Medicine at the Tel Aviv University the chairman of the Division of Ophthalmology at the Tel Aviv Medical Center, mm -hmm. president of the Israeli Ophthalmological Society, and recently one of the power list of the ophthalmologists. As we do in Israel, we will keep the less formal way, and for the purpose of this discussion, we'll use first name basis. and not great having you here. Great to be here, Susanna and Ron. Anat, uh, one of the unique trends that we find in Israel is defense technologies that are translated into medical applications. Bionics is one of them, uh, but we have many more examples and I know that you were involved in more than one. Uh, what are the advantages you see in such a trend? Yeah, I think that uh, adopting defense technologies into the field of medicine has a lot of advantages. I think the fact that it has already been tested and uh, gained a lot of experience in extreme situation, I situations is very helpful to us once we start to incorporate it into the management of our patients. Because, for example, with the bionics technology, something that a pilot, a fighter aircraft pilot used and was able to see all the landscape and know exactly what to do, and the 3D was exercised, the perception of all the little details was exercised, is very, very very beneficial for us. And many of the things that we requested of the system were actually very easy to perform and adopt because of the previous experience of the technology in the defense system. Thank you, Ron. Being uh, the entrepreneur of such a transformation in bionics, can you tell us a bit about the challenges that you have in such a process? And when did you involve the opinion leaders in the process? Yes, I think uh, the biggest challenge 
is by taking a super detailed high-end technology that was invested with a lot tremendous amount of effort and resources and what was designed to pilots and aviation and adapted to the medical field. Uh, so with the maturity also comes the challenge. There is a lot of temptation to take things as is, you know, because it works great for pilots. But there is obviously a gap of, of needs that we, we do not fully understand from the point of view of the surgeons. And I think at that point, this is the critical point that the success is dependent on the KOL, uh, the ability to take that technology that is not fit you know, to the needs of, of the medical field yet, and uh, having the KOL that is creative and tolerant enough on how to direct the development team and to make uh, this as a medical product. And, and this, pro this process takes many years <laughs> and requires uh, patience and, uh, and vision from the key oil so if i can add on this one more word i think the collaboration is the main point for and the, is the key for success because you know for example the technical team the tron has could could say you know i can make it i can make the 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 movement of the system faster for you or i can make it uh, easier for you to press on the pedal and these things are not important for me the main important for a, be, may be important for a pilot but not for me for me, the resolution, the 3D is more important. And the fact that we were able to step-by-step step work together on the system, I think that was the key for success for, for this technology. And that maybe that's the place, if you can first refer to the potential of digital solutions in the ophthalmic OR. Well, I t I'll tell you, I think that there is no way back. We are going digital in the OR. It reminds me of the time that we started to look at digital images and I said, oh, actually, why do we need to leave the film? The film is so good. And my boss at my fellowship told me, you know, in 10 years, there will be no film. And that's the situation today. So I think this is what's going to happen in the OR. We will be only digital. The surgical world is really looking and waiting for such a transformation to actually have the abilities of digital technologies to enhance the visualization, to give you a registration of uh, preoperative data, intraoperative data, all the things that the digital systems can do, whereas optical systems cannot do in the same way. So I think it has a huge potential. And I think that in 10 years, we will, five years, we will ask ourselves, how could we operate on, on the eye looking at the eye? where it, as compared to operate the eye, looking at the image of the eye. Ron, do you hear that from uh, many doctors around the world? Are there specific markets that are more excited towards uh, such a technology? Yeah, I completely agree with Anat, first of all. I think that probably today all the markets are pretty much engaged in the digital, you know, digital solution direction. Uh, obviously, you know, we were headed uh, directly to US and Europe, you know, Western markets, but we see it globally from the, from the entire, of, entire world. And, and, you know, completing also, you know, the picture and, and looking at it from the point of view, again, of the cockpit, because we're from, from aviation originally. So uh, wrapping it up, you know, we can say, I can say that uh, like, like we did many years uh, for aviation and created the cockpit, and gave the pilot, you know, I, I, I'm dividing it to three parts, you know, visualization, you know, seeing better images, you know, in the ophthalmic, control that the surgeon will have, uh, like, like the pilot and control of the system, the data, and the data and, and the information availability and usage, you know, if it's an existing data or, or guidance data, but it's very, very critical to, all, to have all, all, all of these working together. So uh, the idea is to have a system that will support the surgeon to perform as close as possible the surgery on a perfection level, giving all the tools that are not needs, you know, without taking a toll. So the surgeon can be concentrated 100% in the surgery and the system will work for the surgeon. And, and, and this is the idea and, and, and the concept of not, ho not only having the digital information, but m making it accessible uh, for the surgeon with no toll at all. So I, I, have, I had the Ryan on that. <laughs> Great. So before I wish uh, you uh, all the luck, Ron, I think uh, we, we had, you have a great dynamics here that is very, very unique to the Israeli ecosystem in which European leaders can really become partners of, of the company. 
sometimes we, we, we push them a bit uh, too much, but they always very welcome him. And that's uh, great to have people like uh, you are not on board. So on, good luck with uh, launching your product. And thank you very much for participating in this discussion. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for inviting us. Yes, thank you. Thanks. For our final conversation, Susanna speaks with two leaders in Israel's VC space about the financial future of Israel's ecosystem. Nahum Ferreira of Ion Medical also describes his path to securing a successful first round of funding. Let's listen in. For our discussion, I'm happy to have also uh, Michal Geva with us. Michal is the managing partner and co-founder of uh, Tree Ventures. Uh, Michal has 25 years of executive management experience in medtech and in digital health uh, startups in Israel and in the U.S. And she's the first woman uh, to found and manage a venture capital fund in Israel. And also in 2017, Michal was recognized as one of the 50 most influential women in Israel by Globes, uh, which is the Israeli leading financial journal. Michal, happy to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Michal, I would like to turn the first question to you. Uh, although we have a lot of innovations in Israel and a variety of uh, interesting opportunities, the number of VCs and investors is quite limited. Can you start by referring to the Israeli investment ecosystem from the eyes of the investors? Uh, what are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And also, maybe you can speak about companies that are seeking for investment. Sure. So first of all, it is true, you know, the landscape has changed in the healthcare environment. If I need to put it in categories, I think we had the biotech, we have the pharma, we have the medical devices, which Ion is part of, and we have the digital health. We at TriVentures, we are focused more on digital health and medical devices. But interesting enough, it is interesting to see the development that have happened in the past decade in devices versus digital. A lot of the investors, unfortunately, um, gone out a little bit of the medical devices and there is much less capital available, not only in Israel today, but in the world for devices. Uh, and we see a huge dramatic change and a dramatic entrance into the digital health space. By the way, which ophthalmology is also playing a major role in that, um, in that sector. But you know, Zana, there's never a vacuum. So yes, we still have several different medical device VCs that are, are investing here in Israel. But one of the interesting things that we've seen is the entrance of the strategic of the corporate VCs. I don't know if you know, but we at TriVentures, we're great believers in working with the companies on one hand and with the industry on the other hand. So we have about 12, 13 different strategic VCs on our fund, from Johnson & Johnson, Medtronic, all the way to Samsung and Nikon and everything in between. And we're very, very fortunate to have that. But on the other hand, we see those type of organizations entering much more forcefully today, not only into funds, but in actually into investing directly in companies. We've seen it with uh, Nahum's last round, which was um, we had a large uh, um, strategic participate. We see it more and more often. Uh, we've seen it with several other ophthalmology companies that we're investing in. We see very often nowadays. Thank you. Maybe that's the time, Nahum, to say congratulations on your very successful round that was done in a difficult time worldwide. Can you uh, refer to that a bit? Uh, Tr uh, Venture took part of that and... And Michal mentioned a strategic, I guess it wasn't easy. Can you talk about uh, some of the challenges and how did you overcome them? Yeah, so, so first of all, to raise funds is never easy. And it was even more challenging during the, the COVID pandemic. Actually, that's a result of a lost, long lasting relationship with uh, some of the investors that I met, uh, you know, back then, even five, six years ago, and it was not ready uh, to invest back then, but you know, the, the, the long uh, relationship became fruitful eventually. Uh, so I think that's helped. Uh, from, on the other hand, actually, you know, everybody had time to meet and to speak and, and, and to learn more and to dig more. So that made the all due diligence process even harder. 
and I needed to to take uh, uh, into account the time difference because and, and that's something which is in a way unique to Israel uh, because in, in, in the recent time we had investors from China, from Japan, from Canada, from Israel, of course, and Israel serves in a way as a bridge between those countries. So I, I needed to, to have like three time zones in my mind all the time. And I, I saw, you know, the kids of, of my, my investors, uh, they saw mine that came suddenly into, into the cause. But yes, it, it was uh, challenging. But eventually, you know, because uh, I'm medical reach uh, um, a very, to a very successful point with the clinical data, with the end world, that is a real game changer, that that eventually led uh, uh, the reason for the, the successful round. And I'm really happy that it, it is actually oversubscribed. Uh, so, yeah, I'm very proud of it. And then it's just the start of a new era and a lot of other uh, extensive work for, for the company, for the team. Sounds like a big, happy family. Uh, <laughs> and I know the Tree Venture is, is escorting the company and invested not only in this round. And I wanted to ask both of you, how do you see the advantage of having an Israeli investor as part of the round? So, if I may start, I think that uh, especially in that kind of round that done remotely with people that uh, actually never been to the company, having a great partner like Private Venture, which is, you know, not just an investor, uh, if I may say, in smart money and, and really uh, involved in the company uh, day-to-day uh, activity, that serves as an anchor, I believe, for uh, in the other investors that uh, all of them wanted to speak with the with the existing investors that are on ground and can really know that I'm not only an avatar, but a real person and, and there is a real uh, company uh, behind us with all the uh, uh, achievements we've got. Yeah, Zana, I think... Yeah, go ahead, sorry. I think what Nachum is, is describing is very, very accurate. We see it very often where... Um, external investors, meaning investors that are not based at the country where the company is, are interested to see buy-in, are interested to see mentorship, are interested to see close connection and work with the company. That is, on one hand, a validation, and on the other hand, a true support, I would say, to, to people that, um, you know, the, today the world is kind of flat with Zoom, right? We're even doing this conference in Zoom. But we usually, you know, like to work with people uh, in a more intimate way. And I think being with the company, seeing, being with the team, not just the management is important. And, um, you know, when we invest in, com- in companies outside of Israel, I always would like to see a local partner and it goes both ways. So I think that, um, that that is helpful. And on the other hand, Nahum has done a tremendous work on really building partnership, not just investors, but partnerships with different markets, different um, ecosystem players from strategics to financial investors. But they all bring a lot of value added but in different sectors. For example, we have um, Rachel from uh, Rimonchi, which is um, an investor that specializes in, um, in ophthalmology. And the amount of value that she brings to the table with her team on the ground, working with Nachum and his teams on the regulatory, on opening doors in China, on the clinical work is invaluable. We have investors from the U.S. that are working on the board and off the board with ION and the team. We have investors now from Japan. We have investors from Israel. And I think the way that ION has built its infrastructure um, is extremely helpful for the growth of the company. That's exciting. So, guys, thank you so much. I wish you both a lot of luck. And thank you for sharing your opinions with us. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this special edition of the OIS podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our iTunes channel so you don't miss any ophthalmology insights. Got a story of your own to tell? Apply to be a guest at ois.net.